Despite the fact that technologies are a tool that, is, that can be used for either good or bad, I'm afraid that we are approaching the ultimate frontier where the technology can, can lead us and can influence us. In three decades, more than half the population might be cyborgs. And what we might face is a scenario where um, there's a huge difference between the haves and have-nots, where the rich are able to augment themselves physically and cognitively. For me, there are certain boundaries, and one of them is not to incorporate technologies on the scale as Neil Harbison has in his own body. However, it is, of course, his own decision. I love the technology and I love this idea, but if I have to do it myself, I will not do it. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great for me to be back with you, not least because yesterday I challenged you to think about what is a nation state? What is the relationship between a citizen and their country? And that was quite deep and philosophical and indeed entertaining in its own way. Uh, but today we're getting even more personal in our challenge, in our sort of disruption theme, uh, because we are addressing what it means to be human. What are we as a species and how can we change ourselves as a species. And to think about this, we have the most fascinating guest today, and I want you, I'll tell you a little bit about him, and then I want you to give him a very warm welcome. With me is Neil Harbison. Neil is an artist, he's a campaigner, and he is a cyborg. Um, even at first look, you can see that Neil has adapted himself in a way that the rest of us in this room have not. Uh, Neil, <laughs> I think I'm right in saying that, although stand up anybody who actually has also got cyborg facility. Um, but anyway, the point about Neil, and he's gonna explain it himself, is that he, uh, as part not just of his art, but also his quest for uh, an evolutionary step, has changed his physical essence, and I'm going to get him to explain it. But before I do any of that, I want you to give him a very warm welcome. So please give Neil Harbison a very warm welcome. Neil, I think we need to start with some basics for those of you, uh, for those of us in the audience who do not know uh, about the way you've undertaken this adaptation. You call yourself a cyborg, uh, but what have you done to, to give yourself that new sort of existence? Explain it. Yeah, so a cyborg is the combination of cybernetic organism. So I am a cybernetic organism because I've uh, added cybernetics in my body. I have an antenna implanted in my skull that allows me to extend my perception of color beyond the visual spectrum. So the antenna receives uh, from infrared frequencies to ultraviolet frequencies, and I receive these colors as vibrations inside my skull, and then these vibrations inside my head become sound, so I can actually hear the sound of colors uh, from infrareds to ultraviolets. There's also another implant, which is internet connection, so people can send colors to my head from other parts of the world, so my sense of color doesn't need necessarily need to be the color that is around me. I could receive uh, colors from Australia if my friends stream live images from Australia to my head. So, so uh, I mean, I've got a telephone in my pocket somewhere. If I took a picture, let's say I was sitting in the UK and you were in Barcelona, where you, you spend a lot of your time, uh, I could take a picture of something in London. I could send it direct to my head. into your head, to your brain, through that, that Wi-Fi receiver, which is part of your antenna, and, and, and you would without any mediation, you'd be able to see it in your brain, would you? I would perceive the colors of the image. So mostly they send videos, so it's live video. So if uh, they send the colors of a sunset, I feel it's a sunset. So I suddenly feel that I'm uh, in front of a sunset. Or if they send colors in a the supermarket, then it's a supermarket. If they send colors at night, my friends can actually color my dreams. So if they start sending blue colors when I'm asleep, my dream might suddenly become blue or my dream might shift to the sea or to the sky, so my friends can actually influence my dreams by sending colors at night. So I see this as the use of the internet as a sensory extension or as a, as a sense itself. I can also use the internet connection 
uh, to, to connect to uh, satellites, so then I, my sense of color can be outside this planet. I use it to connect to NASA's International Space Station, so then I can oh feel God. colors uh, from space. <laughs> so I think I, we can also see in the future how we can uh, have sensors that are not in this planet, but sensors that are in space, and in a way, this is a way of exploring space without having to physically go there. I call this being a sense-tronaut or mind-tronaut, because we can have sensors in space while our bodies are here. Uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, I, I'm really lost for words, but um, I'm struggling here. Thank God we get audience questions. Um, so it, the, it, it's all about color. You hear color, but, but could this, be, you know, I don't know whether you're going to refine it or whether you want to move forward and, and take it further. Could it be about more than color? Could you yeah. turn vibration into an even more sophisticated sort of tool? Yeah, because color is just a little part of a wider spectrum. Mm. So I'm now in infrared and ultraviolets. Beyond that, there's microwaves and radio waves, so I could be sensing other things. So infrared, for example, allows me to know if there's movement detectors in a room, so I can go to a shop or a bank and tell if the alarms are on or off, and in many cases, they're off. So it's interesting to sense <laughs> that some of these Infrared sensors are not actually working, and also uh, ultraviolet allows me to detect if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. If I feel there's a high level of ultraviolet, then I just put some extra cream or I avoid the sun. So just if you go a bit beyond the visual spectrum, then you get more uh, information from other types of... Right, I mean, this is, uh, this is giving you, in a, I was going to say, in a sense, the word sense is the key word here, You're, you, you, you've gotten technology now fused into your body, into your head and brain in particular, which gives you a, a, a sense that none of the rest of us have, in a way. Yeah, but I compare myself with other species, so I feel that it's natural to have this. I, many species can sense infrared and ultraviolet. Many species have antennas, so I d define myself as trans-species because I'm adding sensors and organs that are traditional for other species, and I find this very natural because it's natural uh, well, to it, sense infrared and ultraviolet but it, for other species. It, it, it's clearly not natural. In fact, it's <laughs> deeply unnatural. I mean, if it were natural and if one were to go back to Darwinian principle and, and the evolutionary theory, if it were natural, it would have, you know, grown out of your head. <laughs> but it, it didn't grow out of your head. You presumably persuaded some sort of doctor, and I want to ask you what kind of doctor, to, to, to actually undertake a major operation to stick this in your head. Well, I... First of all, I presented this surgery to a bioethical committee, and right. they said it was not ethical. So no, in the I'm end, sure they, they, they said uh, this is not ethical for three reasons. One, because it's not regenerating a pre-existing sense, yeah. and they find this is not ethical. You should only regenerate pre-existing senses. Also, it's not a pre-existing body part. Uh, if it was an arm or a, a leg, they would find it ethical, but yeah. an antenna is not traditional uh, body part. <laughs> and third, they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with yes. an antenna sticking out of the head. So <laughs> they said, no, to the surgery, but I tried to find a doctor willing to do the surgery anonymously, and I found one, and then we did the surgery. It's very... Where, uh, where was it done? In Barcelona. In Barcelona. Yes. Interesting. Um, so those of you who really want one of these, uh, you, you, you know where to go. But, 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 uh, but uh, 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 the ethics are important because, you know, and, and I think some of the young uh, people in the video alluded to this at the very start of this session, that there are all sorts of ways in which this is worrying and alarming, are there not? I mean, not wow. least because you call yourself trans-species, but you're acquiring um, abilities that are beyond the capacity of other human beings, but also only available to those who have the means, the resources, the finances, to undertake this sort of thing. So you're creating a, a, possibly an uber-species. No, that's why I created the Cyborg Foundation, which is a non-profit organization that wants to help anyone that wants to uh, add new senses or new organs, and we, we try to make it as um, available as possible, open source senses, um, and I think it's not expensive to create a new sense. We are already using all these senses, but we are giving all these senses to machines. Your car can probably sense what's behind it, but you can't sense what's behind you, but those senses could be adapted to your body so that you can sense what's behind you. The technology already exists, it's really simple and cheap. Also, hand, hand dryers are using uh, detectors that detect uh, your hand. These chips, I think, cost 10 cents. So you can just add them to your body and then you can add a new sense. It's just simply people who wish 
to extend their perception, they can do it. And now that, that that's true, I mean, in a funny sort of way, having been completely gobsmacked by what you described as your new abilities, I'm now thinking to myself, actually, it's not that big a deal. I mean, I, I could go to a store and buy a set of night vision goggles, and then I'd have a new capacity, a new sensual ability. So, so what's the big deal? Well, you would be wearing glasses, and the difference is that I think it's, there's a, I'm not using technology, and I'm not wearing technology. I am technology. This is a, a fundamental difference. Uh, um, it's different. Yeah. It's different. Because uh, uh, the, the, um, I use technology. I, I use my phone, for example, but it's different from having a body part. Uh, I don't feel that this is uh, anything different from any of my other uh, It is just organs. an intrinsic part of you, yeah. Uh, I actually, well, I don't know if anybody's seen it. I, I watched a movie called um, Ghost in the Shell the other day. Has anybody seen that? It's a new movie. It's a sort of post Blade Runner movie. And for those of you who've seen Blade Runner and all those sorts of, um, you know, uh, ruminations on where humanity's going in terms of our relationship with, with uh, bioengineering and, and technolo technology and cloning and all of that. Where do you see yourself on that human journey? Well, yeah, it's a big tree with different directions and mm. different branches. I see myself in a, I would call it not AI, but AS. It's artificial senses. It's different from AI. If the antenna was telling me the names of colors, that would be AI. Uh, but it's AS. I'm receiving the vibrations of color, and then my brain needs to figure out what all this is. So my brain needs to work. If you add an artificial sense to your body, your brain still needs to work. If you add AI, your brain doesn't really need to work. So I think it's much more exciting to add ASs to our bodies, because then our brain needs to figure out what's happening, and then the knowledge becomes more unique, and the intelligence becomes more unique to each person. This same antenna to different people would have a different effect, whereas if it was AI, we, AI, we would be saying the same things. So we are developing uh, different senses, and these senses will have different effects to each person, because in the same way that we all have eyes, ears, and nose, but we use them differently, it's the same with AS, that we will, it will have a different effect. The eye will be created by the brain, not by the machine. Do you feel like a very different person since you acquired your appendage? Your Yes, I see life differently. I see that now, for example, getting old is exciting because I know that my senses can actually get better the older I get because technology keeps evolving. So if you are technology, you can keep evolving during your lifetime. So my senses uh, are no longer uh, seen as that they will degenerate the older I get. They can actually get better. So I see getting old as a good thing now. And also but why bother getting older at all? I mean, uh, the, the other year here, uh, in, in, the, in the same chair that you're in today, we had Aubrey de Grey, a, a guy who is committing his entire life to the search for um, a technology to allow us to conquer aging. I'm doing this as well, but in an different, entirely different way. So I'm creating an, uh, an, a sensory organ for the sense of time. So we all have a sense of time, but we don't have an organ for the sense of time. So I've created this uh, circular implant. It will be like an orbit that it will allow me to feel time. So it's a point of heat that will go around my head, and it will take 24 hours for the heat to go around my head. So I will automatically know what time it is by feeling <laughs> the heat around my uh, head. I cannot tell you how ridiculous that sounds. I mean, I have something called a watch. And, <laughs> and it, it, it just sits here on my wrist quite happily, and you know, it's a remarkable yeah, piece of technology, is... which the Swiss, God knows, the Swiss are very good at. Oh, yes, the Swiss, but that, I think there'll be a changes with this. Uh, this, is, this is AI, whereas this is a uh, sense of time. I don't want to know what time it is. The, the aim of this project, of having a, um, an orbit around my head, is not to know what time it is, but to be able to, to change my perception of time. If we have an organ for time, we will be able to change our perception of time. So once this becomes normalized, and my brain accepts this as being normal, then I'll be able to modify the speed in which the heat goes around my head. So if I want time to go slower, I'll program the heat to go a bit slower, and I should feel that time goes a bit slower. Or if I want to feel time goes faster, I'll, I'll program it so it goes faster. Or if I want to travel in time, I can make it spin twice so that I feel that I'm tra in traveling in time. Or if I'm on a plane, I can put it on flight mode so that I have less jet lag. And 
eventually I could change my perception of age. If you want to live longer, what you need to do is modify your brain, not your body. If you fool your brain to think that you are 150 years old, you will feel that you are 150 years old with the body of a 70-year-old uh, person. So it's basically taking Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice and to see whether or not we can modify our perception of time if we have an organ for time. Right. Uh... <laughs> I'm beginning to feel that you definitely need to get a passport for Liberland and go and live yes, in Liberland. Yes, I'm so sure. <laughs> uh, but, but leaving that aside, is this, art, is this art or is this, you know, are you just trying to provoke us? And it's, God knows, it's fascinating. But or, or, or do you really want all of us to look at the technologies that you're uh, deploying on yourself and as your message to us that you know we should open our minds all of us as human beings to to changing and adapting and improving our potential yes for sure I think we should all design ourselves we as a species have been for thousands of years designing the planet we've been changing the planet in order to survive I think this is completely wrong we shouldn't have invented the light bulb uh, this allows us to see at night but we should have invented night vision instead of lighting up the planet we should have created night vision instead of uh, creating uh, cars or airplanes to fly we should try to fly ourselves so I think designing ourselves is a way of saving this planet from being destroyed from uh, all of this energy that we're creating also heating up a room and co cooling it down in the summer is completely ridiculous. We should be able to uh, regulate our own temperature. And once we start doing this, uh, we won't be affecting other species so much and we won't be affecting but, this planet yeah, But so there's much. this phrase that always comes up in when we get into the field of ethics uh, and, and technology, and, and that is this notion of playing God. And in a sense, you want to play God with... The, 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 the basics of, of you know, human physical reality. And I talked about evolution earlier. Surely the lesson of uh, the more we know about the way species have evolved on our planet, the more we understand that delicate balance and, and that the importance of the, the principle of natural selection and evolution over time. And, and you, in this 21st century where our technological abilities are so profound, you're challenging all of that. I feel I'm collaborating with God in a way. Uh, it's not, uh, <laughs> I'm not going against God. I'm actually collaborating with nature and with God. And in a way, this will be much helpful. Uh, I think if we, if we... You're, if, you know, you're fundamentally impatient. You know, e evolution is something that plays out over eons. And you're saying, because you know a bloke who's very good at building antennae and, and you know, you've got a doctor in Barcelona who's prepared to ignore the ethics, you're saying, I, I, I'm just going to adapt and evolve myself just like that, because I can. But, but that seems to me to be a, a very dangerous proposition. I think it's a very natural uh, thing. We've been evolving ever since we started existing. We, are, we started being like kind of bacteria in the ocean, then we, we tried to escape the ocean, then we lived on trees, and then we, we went away from the trees, and now we are actually trying to live in space. So if we want to be the first species that survive in, survives in space, we need to modify ourselves, and not, that's what's happening now. I think we are slowly... Uh, transforming ourselves in a species that will be able to survive in other um, planets. And but, but you're, just the you, yeah, it. it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're swimming against a, a, a really strong tide of, of public um, suspicion and mistrust. I mean, only because what you're talking about is so profound and, and so sophisticated and challenging in many ways because you're addressing the very nature of what the human species is. But look at the nature of the debate about relatively, you know, less fundamental and challenging propositions like, you know, g genetically modifying and re-engineering some of our plants and, and food crops. And yeah, I don't like that. Uh, but I, I you think, don't like that? No, but I think we should modify genetically ourselves. So I, I would rather have this antenna uh, be genetically uh, added to myself. So I, I, in the future, I, I, in the end of this century, I should be able 
if I'm still alive, to 3D print this antenna with my own DNA. So then this antenna will be fully organic. It won't be metal. And then I should be able to add infrared and ultraviolet perception by genetically modifying my genes. So if you want to have specific senses, you should be able to add them during your lifetime by genetically modifying yourself. And I think so, that's... Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is so important. So you're saying if, if, if you genetically modify yourself to include the sort of antenna, uh, if you were to, to uh, procreate, you would have children and your female partner were then to uh, yes. give birth, the baby would come out with an antenna on its head? I yeah, mean, most probably, yes, but it's still possible that... <laughs> Also, with, uh, if you genetically modify yourself and you add infrared and ultraviolet perception, it by, might be dominant, so it might also, the child might be born with infrared and ultraviolet perception. We are witnessing the renaissance of our species, and I think we should be uh, conscious that this, this is happening, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not something, uh, it's not science fiction. It's already possible to 3D print organs, and it's just a little change to 3D print new organs and to add new senses in a, in a very organic way. Now I'm using technology, I'm using wires, but this is just temporary. The aim is to, right. we should be fully organic. It'll be a different look when you've well, refined organic. it. Yeah. All right, okay. The, 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 I cannot tell you how interesting I find this. I hope you share it with me. Uh, and we've got a question which uh, we're going to bring up on the screen to see just how the mood of our gathering is on some of the challenging thoughts that Neil is presenting to us. Here we go. Would you enhance your body through technology if permitted? Well, you know, Neil doesn't care if it's permitted or not. He's just going to do it anyway. But anyway, it, let's imagine it, it is permitted. So would you, given the chance, enhance your body through technology? Yes, no. I don't quite know what even more means. I mean, I think it means don't just go for the antenna to allow you to sort of hear color and go into the infrared spectrum. It just means imagine any kind of wonderful new sensual ability that you could imagine, and would you go for it if you could? Uh, well, we'll leave that running for a bit, but, but it's interesting. The, the result would be very different if we were you know, teenagers, uh, with teenagers or uh, people, well, it would be a different, I, I know that the, most really? people will not, will say no here, but uh, most people that I um, receive emails from people who really... If you keep uh, talking long enough, the, the, <laughs> the yes and the no are going <laughs> to... Go on. Yeah, I think we will see this happening in the late 20s. It's still not. But your, me your message, don't, yeah, don't get too distracted by that because, <laughs> because you, you, you're making the case very powerfully yourself. You, are you saying that, that your experiences that, uh, you know, through your art and through your cyborg campaigning, that you find young people are extraordinarily excited about yes. this proposition? Yeah. Uh, and old fogies like me are all too frightened, yes. are we? Is that, that generally yes. is it? Because we grew up, people who grew up in the 20th century grew up with this fear that the union between humans and technology is negative. So it's really difficult to eliminate this, um, this, all this culture that went against the union between humans and technology. Whereas uh, most people that are born in the 21st century, they've seen technology being merged in a way, in a very positive way. And, and they've grown up with technology in a way that I, it makes them feel identified. Uh, it's well, not it's so much as a, as a tool, but a, a sense of identity. Many people identify as cyborgs, but they want to have surgery because they want to have the body of a cyborg in the same way that someone might identify as a woman, but is born with the body of a man, and then they want to have, a, in the future, the body of a woman. Mm. There's children that are born now with the sense of that they are cyborgs, that, but the, their body is not cyborg, and that's why they'll have these new senses and new organs. And that's, that's uh, teenage, really young uh, teenagers. Really? Yes. I mean, would that be true of you? you? You grew up with a sense that you... No, not me, no. no but I, I've, it's a new type of people that I have emailed. I, I felt cyborg afterwards. I felt that the word cyborg really defined what I felt, that I felt that I was not using or wearing it. It, it felt that it was me. Feeling no difference between the software and the brain, mm. and feeling no difference between the antenna and any of my other body parts. That's yeah, yeah. Does it get in the way when you sleep? Actually, if there's a wall, then I keep uh, make sounds. If because uh, I'm officially taller now, because this is part of my. Uh, so I had to get used <laughs> to the. I had to get used to the new height. Nicolas uh, Sarkozy would have loved one of those. <laughs> it, 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 the heels and the antenna. He could have said to Carla, "Hey, I'm six foot tall. It would have been fantastic." But um, how far 
can you take this? Paint me a picture of, you know, I don't know whether you'll live long enough, but your dream, what would your dream be for, for your, your abilities and your cyborg facility as, 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 uh, when perfected? Well, my dream is that we, we will stop modifying the plant. That's the, I think the aim for me is that the more we uh, modify ourselves, the less we'll modify the plant. I am, also, yeah, I, I think understand. sharing senses with other species is a way of also connecting with other species. We've, I feel humans have built like a sort of bubble, and we look at other species as something else. But if we share senses with other species, we'll be able to connect in ways that we're not connecting now. I feel much more connected to species that sense infrared now. If I see my cat staring at the wall, and I sense that there's infrared in the wall, I know that my cat is staring at the infrared, not at the wall. Or if I see many bees going to a specific flower, and I sense there's a high level of ultraviolet, uh, I know that the bees are going there because of this. So I feel connected to other species in ways that I didn't. And I think that's something that will really um, be beautiful mm. if, if our species connects with other species. No, I, 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 that, it's a fascinating way of looking at what needs to change on our planet. Maybe it does need to be <laughs> us more than the planet. But a final question for me, then I'm going to open it up. It seems to me you must be a fundamental optimist um, about human nature, because you know you're investing so much faith in in the goodness of those who are pushing the boundaries of technology and allowing this sort of cyborg movement to grow. You don't see it in any way as potentially dangerous or malign. Whereas I would just argue to you that the recent history of the human species suggests that it could so easily be manipulated in, in dangerous and even species-challenging ways. Yeah, there are dangers, but anything, everything has its own dangers, like everything. Like a, a knife can be used to cut bread or to kill people. Your mobile phone could be used to detonate bombs or to communicate. I think new senses, I don't think, brings any new threat. I think it, it, it's simply a very personal experience. So it's not creating any new threat. The only issue is uh, my senses are uh, connected to the internet, so I can be physically hacked, but in the same way that I could be poisoned out there. So if there's uh, uh, food or drinks, I could be poisoned, but I could also be physically hacked. And it, through all these years, it only happened once that someone without permission uh, sent images to my head. But I actually liked it, so it wasn't a, a bad <laughs> experience. <laughs> What, 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 what? <laughs> now that you've started the story, you can't stop. What, what did, what, what he did they... Sent, uh, he sent uh, selfies. He sent selfies. Ah. So I felt I could hear the sound of his face, the colors of his face. Um, it was his face. Good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, oh, my God. It, it, there, there's so many different ways we could take this conversation. Um, and I feel it, it would be wrong for me to only put my own questions to Neil, because I suspect there would be some fascinating thoughts and insights from the audience. So uh, we, we're, we're making lunch a bit late, so we've got, a, you know, we've got a decent amount of time just to get some questions from you guys. So uh, I'll start over here, and then I'll move around the room. We've got uh, microphones, so... So my name is Marcus from the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan. So I'd like to praise you to be here, to be able to face disbelief and sometimes even radicalization. But I would like to ask if, according to your manifesto of cyborgs, do you consider people they use it for magical purposes, for example, cochlear, cochlear implants for the deaf people, or transcranial impulses, which are used to treat epilepsy as cyborgs? And why do you choose to, to do that as to focus on the, on the performance of the cyborg, uh, adding of senses, why we could you focus, could you maybe more good for focusing on the medicine part of it, which is already happening and we didn't touch on this topic in this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I think cyborg identity is broad. There's different types of cyborg identity. There's uh, many psychological cyborgs. Many of you are probably already psychological cyborgs. You already um, we are merged with cybernetics in a psychological way, and you probably talk about technology in first person. Like, 
20 years ago, most people would say, my mobile phone is running out of battery. Now many people say, my, I, I'm running out of battery, as if you were running out of battery. So there's already a sense of <laughs> psychological union between uh, humans and technology. So I would call these type of people psychological cybers. Then there's biological cybers, people who, like me, have biologically merged with technology. And then there's two branches, people who have voluntarily done that, like myself, and people who have done it for medical reasons. I mean, my dad has two artificial hips. Is he a cyborg? If he identifies as such, yes. Well, he's 86. I don't think he's thought about it. But, <laughs> well, but I met the, the man. Do I need to call him and say, Dad, you know what? You're actually a cyborg. I mean, maybe uh, if, uh, if, if, he, uh, if he identifies as such. Um, right. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. So it is a question of self-identity to yeah. a certain extent. Um, uh, we've got so many. Let's go to the lady over there, and then we'll come back over here. Yep. You, ma'am. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Elisa, I'm from Dubai. Uh, but what really I find particularly interesting about this is you're basically turning yourself into a synesthete. So, you know, there's people with synesthesia where they have a crossing of, of their uh, senses, you know, they're able to hear uh, colors or taste sounds. Um, and this is essentially what you've been able to, to no, do, no, right? because I, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm colorblind. I didn't t say that, but I, I don't see color, so it's not the union of two senses, because to me, color is not visual. I, I sense it as a vibration in my head that becomes uh, a sound. So it's also, it's not sound, it's a vibration in my head. It's different from audio sound. So it's a new s sensory input uh, that it's I cannot a, compare with any other. But so I, even the audio is not like w audio that we would necessarily No, it's an inner how, how vibration you, that becomes a sound. How did you teach yourself to interpret. It took me three years. The vibration. It right. took me three years, and I used different cards to memorize the names that people give to these frequencies. Um, God, it's it's so interesting. Uh, and for people who, you know, can't do it, it sounds impossible. But obviously, it's not impossible. No, it takes longer. It's, the AI is faster. You, I would, I would have known the colors around me automatically on the first day if I mm. had used AI. But I thought it was more interesting to use. AS, and it's changed my brain in this way. Mm, mm. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is George. Actually, Neil has a very good point about that it's natural because there is a research in neuroscience which has been done for the last 50 years that gives blind people ability to see, blind people who never seen from birth, ability to see by sensing a vibration on their back. And after just four days, they perceive mental images of shape supplied by the camera, and then to their back, a tactile sensation. Just after four days, neuron images show their visual cortex is activated. Mm. So it's what he's, Neil is talking about is actually backed up by neuroscience. But I actually want to point, uh, come back to this topic about disability. There are, so many people actually who don't have senses that other people have, they can feel disadvantaged. Aren't they more excited about this idea, about this vision, mm. than this audience? Thank you. No, it really depends on each individual. There's uh, organizations of deaf people defending the right to be deaf. Uh, uh, and there's also many blind people that have absolutely no interest in seeing. So. I've met more of these people than the others. And I felt there's people who hear perfectly well who want to hear more or extend their hearing. So it really depends uh, on who you want to compare yourself. Most deaf people don't compare themselves with other people who can hear. And some people who can hear compare themselves with their dog. And then their dog can hear much more. So they want to extend their hearing with the, to the level of their uh, dog. So it really depends who you compare yourself. And I haven't received as uh, no. There is no uh, uh, huge interest in people who lack a sense. No. Uh, yeah, we've got two questions down here. So let's get microphone. Can we get a microphone to the front here? We've got uh, a lady and we've got a gentleman. So we'll get both of their questions. Um, Schneeberger from Switzerland. I would like to know how many more people are like you with uh, with this capability, and do you believe if Beethoven or Picasso would have that ability to see, they would have created even much more fantastic work because they, they feel it, not only they see the color? Um, there are people with 
other sensors, not with this antenna, like my friend Moon Rivas has the seismic sense, it's her own uh, creation. Whenever there's an earthquake in the world, her body vibrates, so she feels all the earthquakes in the world. At the beginning, it was a bit uh, overwhelming. There's earthquakes every 10 to 8 minutes. So the, she keeps feeling these vibrations. It's, she calls it her second uh, heartbeat. She has a heartbeat and the earth beat. She's now used to it. So she is extremely connected to the movements of the earth. So she's, she's now having this year an implant to feel the moon quakes. She will, she will feel also the seismic activity in the moon. So part of her body will be feeling the moon. So it's, it's a way of connecting to earth in a way that no other species has ever done. She's, she's now in Barcelona, but if there's an earthquake in Japan, she will feel it. So it's called the seismic sense. Uh, we also developed the North Sense. It's a chip that you can have implanted and it vibrates whenever you uh, face the magnetic north. So you feel the magnetic north of the planet. And many species have this sense. They feel the north. Apparently we also had it. So it might actually awake dormant senses that our species used to have. So sometimes technology can actually awake senses. And in the way of art, I see the creation of this as an art. I see this as cyborg art, the creation of new senses as an art, the creation of new body parts as an art, and the design of your perception of reality as an art itself. But I'm the only one experiencing it. So a way of sharing this experience is by creating external artworks through this new sense. So I don't know if other artists in the past would have had the technology, maybe they would have also created new senses, but I think they would have created as an art itself. Instead of sculpturing, uh, sculpturing a piece of stone or wood, you can sculpture yourself and uh, you can uh, modify or mold. Instead of clay, you can mold your brain. And I see these as my art. Uh, but in the same way that photography has two parts, you take the picture, you're the only one experiencing the picture, and then you decide if you want to develop this picture to an audience or not. It's the same with cyborg art. I'm the only one experiencing this art, but then I decide how to share this experience with an audience. And just on the most literal, superficial level, does it matter to you, you know, you, you want to develop now the, the internal sort of time uh, sensor thing in your head. Uh, I don't know whether you plan on putting that as an exterior feature or an... No, it will be inside, fully inside, between the skin and the head. We have plenty of empty space between the skin and the skull here. <laughs> and it's a very safe area, so <laughs> it will be an inner crown. Have you talked to a doctor about this? No, but I don't need a doctor for this. I needed a doctor for uh, drilling the head, but you don't really need a doctor for putting implants inside the skin. You can use uh, body hackers. Uh, what? Uh, uh, there's many body hackers that can do this, yes. Uh, uh, I'm losing... I'm, uh... Fascinated though I am, I'm losing the desire to join you uh, in some of this, but um, uh, yes, sir. Oh, actually, yes, you, sir. Sorry. Uh, have you uh, taken any medical uh, images of your, of your brain after it's evolved to make use of the sense to see if your perception of color is different from the perception of color in someone who wasn't born uh, colorblind? Yeah, and, I had an uh, MRI you, scan. On can you switch? switch it off at night, no, maybe totally close not. eyes. It's always on, so I decided it should have no switch in the same way that our senses have no switches. We can block our senses in the same way I can block my antenna, but we cannot switch our senses off. So it's always on. And yeah, I've had an MRI scan of my brain. It was on a documentary on television, and it, you could see how doctors could not really understand what was happening. So by looking at the brain, you cannot tell if I am looking at Im an image or listening to a sound or Really, they, they couldn't, they, were, they had no conclusion, really. But yes, my brain works in a different way uh, than it probably used to work before. But there's no way of telling, because I had no MRI scan before the antenna. So it's a bit uh, ambiguous. Yes. Here's possibly the daftest question I've ever asked anybody. But does your brain have a phone number or an email address? <laughs> Yes, there's a, but only five people have it, one in each continent. So uh, it, to me, it's like having an, an I in each continent. Yes, five, five people have a, it's a phone number and a, an address that you can... Uh, Go direct. Yes. Into you. Yes. <laughs> and if there's a hacker, <laughs> and hackers, if, if there's a good hacker in a room, then they can... Could don't tempt it. them. I'm no. sure there are. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we need to go there. Uh, right, we've got time for a couple more, I'm sure. You, sir? I, uh, does it work? Yeah. yeah. I'm Alexander Penn. I'm from ETH Zurich. I have a rather technical question. How do you power all these devices in your 
Do you have a, a battery or do you So now I use recharge? external coil. So, so you can charge implants with external coil, but the aim, uh, I'm we're using blood circulation to charge the antenna. So it will be a small turbine in the blood vessel that will continuously be creating energy and it will charge the chip. And I think we should all aim for body energy. There's many ways of charging our implants with our own energy. We create so much energy that goes uh, wasted so we could easily charge our own yeah, implants. Yeah, it's truly renewable. That's, that's, you're very much zero carbon. That's, that's very good. I mean, I can see that that is a, a, a great solution. Uh, at the back, sir, yes, there you go. Um, hello, my name is Lawrence Narcolang from Humanity in Action. Um, a human rights educational organization. I would like to know that there's this idea that we are all created equal in a lot of democracies and then we transcend through. Now when we have cyborgs in our society, isn't the nature versus nurture dialogue moving towards nurture more? And will we then one day have to establish global development agencies to have more cyborgs in societies outside the Western world so they can actually keep up with the new development of human beings in the Western world and actually not fall behind economically. Mm -hmm. So will being rich by introducing cyborgs to society, will being rich be much more important to be successful one day than anything else? That's, that's a great question. No, because no, uh, it has nothing to do with money. As I said before, you can uh, extend your perception with uh, a dollar, ten dollars, you can use sensors that already exist. It's just willing or not to merge with technology. And we might actually find that most cyborgs will be in Africa because it's cultures that have no fear to merge or to modify themselves or to design themselves. There's many tribes that they've been modifying their body for uh, thousands of years. So it's, it's willing or not to modify yourself is, is the main thing. It's not money, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper because you will find ways of 3D printing this at home. You can 3D print new organs and new sensors at home. So you don't really need a company either. Uh, all these sensors are being open source, so you can easily program small chips. Uh, so it's, it's not about money. It really isn't. All right, I think we've got time for one more, and then my senses poor and human though they are, are telling me that I'm hungry and it's lunchtime. But uh, uh, the, the lady here, she go, you, you ma'am, you get the last question. Thank you very much, Neil. And also, I want to appreciate the courage it takes to sit in front of an audience that is more laughing than anything else. And I think the reason why we do that is because it's so hard to cope with um, your commitment, the level of your commitment to extend your um, perception. And my question is, would there be a way without directly connecting to the brain, because obviously that scares a lot of people in the room, um, to kind of um, you know, experience the possibilities that we would have if we would be as courageous, but without actually going through surgery? So there are attempts within VR to do that. I don't know if you trust that this can actually make a perception increase, or are there any other um, ways to kind of, you know, do yes. like little baby steps into yes, where you are. Yes, definitely. I, I would always suggest to uh, have it outside for a while before you have it implanted. So first, for example, my sense of time, it will be outside first. Then when my, if my brain accepts it, then I'll go to the second part, which is inside. So I call having it outside an exosense. There are exoskeletons, but you can also have an exosense permanently outside. And then if you are accepting this, then you can then have it implanted. First, you, there's two risks. One is that you might have brain rejection, so your brain might reject the new sense. So if your brain is rejecting the new sense, then don't go for the implant. If your brain is accepting the new input, then you can go for the uh, implant. Then they might have, the second risk is uh, uh, body rejection. Your body might reject the material of the implant and uh, then you would have to change the material because we all have different types of compatibility with materials. But that's the two things, yes. I think we should all have it first outside and then inside. Yeah, all right. Well, look, Neil, I, I think that the questioner made a very good point. It, it, the, 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 not only is what you're doing fascinating, but I think it does take courage to, you know, to, to tell the world about it and to accept that there is a degree of skepticism and a degree of lack of understanding, and I plead guilty that I've learned a lot as we've gone along in this session. It's been, for me, one of the most eye-opening sessions that I've attended at St. Gallen. So uh, it is lunchtime, but before we go off to lunch, please thank Neil Harbison very much indeed. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.